end of this conference here. So um, again, I hope everybody enjoyed the lunch break and as well as the, um, uh, the conference in general. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Michael Wilson. I'm a project manager with the Office of Economic Adjustment and um, just share just a personal piece of information as well. Um, I am a um, retired Army National Guard military police officer where I've served both in the state of North Carolina for the North Carolina National Guard as well as the um, Virginia Army National Guard. So um, just in case you're thinking about breaking the laws, you know, I, I'm eyes on. So, so anyway, um, again, welcome. This session here is on supporting compatible land use around National Guard training sites. Now, one thing that you may have noticed um, all week as you've been sitting in on various sessions is discussions about major um, training facilities, whether it be on the East Coast with Fort Bragg or going all the way to the West Coast with Joint Base Lewis McCord. Got that right. Anyway, but um, this session here is really supposed to be more specifically related to National Guard facilities because as we all know, with the increased deployments of National Guard soldiers in response to numerous um, uh, operations, whether it be Iraq or Afghanistan or even some um, less popular events that we may still be um, engaging in, National Guard soldiers you know, definitely need to ensure that they are uh, receiving the level of training necessary so that they can be successful in these um, missions. So um, that being said, um, the purpose of this session is to um, provide an overview about National Guard training sites and their importance as it relates to training and mission readiness, as well as the importance of um, the partnership that should be occurring between um, these type of facilities along with the community partners surrounding these um, installations. Um, so that being said, let me go ahead and um, introduce uh, the panel. I'm going to introduce each person in the order in which they're going to be um, presenting today. Um, the first panelist that we have here is Lieutenant Colonel Joe Knott. Um, he is the Special Assistant to the G4 for Sustainability and Energy at the National Guard Bureau. Um, he's responsible for sustainability planning and execution for all 24 states and territories. 54 states and territories, thanks. He has served over 32 years in uniform, which, again, talking with him, I, I just find that incredible. Um, <laughs> six of my joints. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, that includes two combat assignments and two tours at the Pentagon where he managed the Army Compatible Use Buffer Program. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Knott holds an MS in Energy Resources Policy and a BS in Environmental Studies. He is a graduate of the Army Command and General Staff College and a 2008 Kinship Conservation Fellow. Our second panelist is Heather Jackson, who is the mayor of Eagle Mountain City in Utah. Uh, she was uh, elected to this position in November 2007 and re-elected to her a second term in November 2009. She currently serves as the chairperson of the Camp Williams Joint Land Use Policy Committee. She also serves as a vice chair for the Regional Planning Organization and chairperson for the Utah County Council of Governments. Mayor Jackson studied business management and horsemanship at Virginia Intermont College and history at Brigham Young University. A third panelist is Captain Drew LeQuick. He is an infantry officer currently serving as the operations supervisor for the Camp Butner training site, which is located in North Carolina. As a representative for the base, he assisted in the final phases of the joint land use study for Camp Butner and is currently working on the implementation of recommendations resulting from the study. And our last panelist is Barry Baker. Uh, Mr. Baker is currently the Granville County Planning Director in North Carolina. He participated in the joint land use study for the Camp Butner National Guard training site and has worked to incorporate JLIS recommendations into the county's land development ordinance. He holds a master's degree in public affairs from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and a bachelor of science degree in political science from Appalachian State University. And he is very proud of that university, by the way. So that being said, let me just give you kind of the layout of the session. What we're going to do is we're going to start off with a um, brief overview just about National Guard training sites in, in general. And then we're going to jump into a discussion that you've probably um, heard um, through different sessions about, you know, the effort that's necessary to really generate the, the community buy-in and support when it comes to building that partnership between the community and the um, military training facility. 
And then the third piece will actually deal with the joint land use study um, that was done for the Camp Butner training site in North Carolina. So what we'll do is we're going to have each presenter do their presentation and then immediately following their presentations, we'll go ahead and facilitate a questionnaire and answering um, segment. And then after that, what we will um, ensure that we do is have each of our panelists um, close out with one um, thought that they want to make sure that you guys are able to take away from this session here. So one thing I do ask is that if you have a question during the question and answering segment, if you can possibly use the microphone. I know we're in a smaller room compared to some of the larger rooms we've been in all week, but it would definitely be helpful to um, use the microphone so everyone is able to hear your question. Um, and then just one final reminder, immediately following this session here, um, the individuals who are attending this conference on ITA um, orders um, will still be attending the OEA wrap-up session that's going to be um, at 3.30 p.m. in room 205, which will be right here. Okay? So um, that being said, we'll go ahead and start with Colonel Knott. Good afternoon. Again, I, I apologize for my voice. I think I lost my voice between Seattle, Washington, and Washington, D.C., and I found a fever between Washington, D.C. and Nashville. So I apologize, and I do have one request. If you support the military, could you please move to the first three or four rows before we start? Anybody that supports the military, please move forward to the first three or four rows. And if you don't, you can leave. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it helps me focus. And while you're moving, we did, I don't know if Michael forgot to mention a special. If you join the North Carolina Guard today, it's a special. You sign up for three years, you get three more years free. So, again, <laughs> see us at the podium after the presentation. So, Drenner will take names. So, again, as my, there we go. Utah will double that. <laughs> six years from six more. And, and thank you for moving up. I appreciate it. Again, as Michael said, I have uh, 33 years in uniform. Started off part time in the Guard in the great state of Ohio. Home of the Reds and the Bungles, Bengals. I've been at, uh, out the Pentagon at the National Guard Bureau for uh, since about 1996. A couple tours, you know, over the desert, those kind of things. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here. I honestly can't believe they pay me to do this job. job. It's the best job in the world. I get to talk to the communities, partner with folks about what we do in the military and how we can actually work together. So I'm like, I honestly get up in the morning, I want to go to work. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. So I'm going to talk, as Michael said, kind of get that broad overview from the National Guard Bureau perspective. And they call it NGB. It's like the corporate headquarters. We're part of the Army Secretariat, Pentagon, Army headquarters. But we're the, the corporate headquarters for all 54 states, Army National Guard, for, in my case, and Air National Guard also. So I'll, I'll paint quickly, before my voice leaves, too, that broad picture where we're going with sustainability, sustainability tools like JLIS, and most importantly, the folks on the ground who actually every day work with the communities and bring them in. So I will point this one up. That's the right there we go. So again, just to give you those folks who aren't familiar with the National Guard, again, not quite as big as the Army, better looking, a little smarter, but not quite as big as the Army. But again, several million acres, thousands of facilities in every state. And so when you talk about communities, you talk about the National Guard. We are in the communities. We're part of the community. I mean, there's, there's no way to separate it. So. Not that we like to have advantages over the U.S. Army, but it's built in. We're already part of this community. So partnering with you makes all the difference in the world is what we do. You see there that uh, nine Army compatible use buffers. That's uh, one of my three-year tours to the Pentagon. I had the honor to, to start that program and run that program for the Army. Again, another great tool like JLIS where it all depends on trust and partnership with your communities and stakeholders. A dozen joint land use studies for the Guard. Again, a good news story that Michael may have mentioned that the guards just now coming around, the training sites in the guards just now coming to the JLIS door to, for opportunity to help us with, with sustainability and keeping our bases open to deal with encroachment and other things like that. So what I'm going to talk about again is as a sustainability person for the National Guard, my job, half my job is to teach the colonels and generals in my office how to spell sustainability, how to spell partnering. Other half of my job is even more fun. I get to help the 54 states and territories through JLUS, through ACUB, through other partners, renewable energy partnerships, anything that helps support that training site in the Army Guard, 
but at the same time, help support the community. Because there's not a thing wrong with the community asking, what's in it for me? Yes, serving your country is great, and by supports the military, but it's a mutually beneficial partnership. JLUS, and like other partnering tools, is not all about the military. It's mutually beneficial, and the cities and the communities around that should get just as much benefit from supporting the military as we gain by you supporting us. I'll talk about these statewide sustainability workshops, which in the next few months we'll be incorporating some instruction on JLUS. So again, tools that the community can become aware of to help put JLUS on steroids basically for the National Guard because we think it's a great tool. And then I'll wrap up with a quick specifics on the ACUB, Army Compatible Use Buffer Program, and then joint land use study and turn it over to the folks who are really doing the hard work on the ground. Okay. So again, why, why do we do anything? Two reasons for us. One, it's the law, and two, it's the right thing to do. Uh, President Obama, about 20 months ago, signed an executive order, a sustainability executive order, as we call it, that says every federal agency, which includes the military and the Guard, less fossil fuels, more, and more energy efficient, more worker safety benefits, less greenhouse gases. We can't get there without partnering with the communities. We're not a little island like we used to think we were 50 years ago. We're part of the community. We can't meet our legal requirements without the community being, being a partner with us and us partnering with the community. The National Guard just followed the Army's lead about four months ago and issued a sustainability policy that applies to every National Guard, every 370-something thousand Army Guardsmen in the United States that says, you will partner, you will get educated on sustainability, you will learn how you can make a difference, and you'll work with the communities on how you do that. So again, if you're familiar with the military, and I'm sure some of you are, it comes from downhill. Commander-in-Chief gives his guidance, Department of Defense says, you're gonna do it, Army told us how to do it, National Guard improved on that, and now we're moving forward. So these, these planning workshops, uh, planning and partnering sustainability workshops. New tool, we've done about, uh, you'll see in a minute a map, seven planning workshops where we mainly internally at a National Guard, pick Arizona for instance, or Texas or Nevada, got the National Guard leadership and those, those folks in the Guard, what is sustainability? And how can we meet our requirements per the law and per the policy? What we're moving forward to, and we had our first sustainability partnering session was in Dallas about two or three weeks ago, where we brought in the communities, the local and state governments, uh, energy companies, other industry folks, universities from the state, uh, NGOs, not-for-profits, very important, all to bring them together, together to talk about, in this case, what the Texas Guard is doing to, to uh, make sure the training sites are secure and take care of the environment, listen to what the partners are doing, and it's, and it's use a technical term, it's blown us away how many partnerships in that short month since then that are gonna come together because most folks are doing the same thing. And I think we all know that if you put everybody's little pots together, you get so much more done together than you do all by yourself out in the stovepipes. That's kind of the whole key with the uh, workshops. Helps the states, it's our job at the corporate headquarters of the Pentagon, helps the state guards work with the communities, give you the tools, the policy, and the resources, just like JLIS does, to make it happen, and then basically get out of the way. It's key that you see TAG, we always have acronyms. TAG is the adjutant general. Again, if you're not familiar with the Guard, every state has an adjutant general. Two-star, works for the governor during the week, uh, federalized and handles the federal missions uh, for the Guard when they're activated for overseas, other, other non-natural disaster type things. That shows the leadership. If the leadership of that Guard isn't there, it doesn't show the commitment to the community. So it's critical in these workshops that the top people in that state Guard be there and sit there for those couple of days and learn and partner with the, the, our stakeholders outside the base, again, purpose to take care of the training sites to make sure they're there now, tomorrow, and 40 years from now, and at the same time, make sure it's mutually beneficial for community members and NGOs and state governments. Let me push again. There we go. So again, key, key message on the slide is mutually beneficial partnerships. You've been in the Army again, 33 years like me. We're kind of used to the old days, you know, we just, we're in our little area, we make a decision, we go for it. And, Get out, get out of our way or don't bother us. Wrong answer, that's not the way you operate, that's not the way you do it. You work it as partnerships that are mutually beneficial. And there's, again, like I said, there's nothing wrong with asking what's in it for me, no matter what role you play in the community, everybody should receive a benefit when they support the, the readiness of a training site in the National Guard. As I mentioned who attends, everybody in this room. 
anybody who's a stakeholder has a, has a, a stake in the community as an elected official to an NGO who wants to preserve green space or clean water to an energy company who looks looking for a place to put solar panels and again benefit the power of the utility for the training sites for the guard again broken down by team so if you're in the procurement business green procurement non toxic type stuff you match up with those folks in the state if you're in the training doing army training equipment or land, land training management taking care of the forest and the lands and you put those in those groups and we look at what common efforts we want to do together and we try to help as best we can from the Pentagon with what we call OPM other people's money OPM is good Mike can get a tattoo tonight OPM right across his left bicep we already talked about that <laughs> that surprised me coming down here with no no voice but again that's good because it helps benefit the communities who we all know never have enough money and so we owe that as part of that what we give to the community in a partnership is to provide some resources. And again, JLOS is a perfect example of that. How we do it? We do it together, bottom line. Leadership in the state, leadership from the Pentagon, leadership from the community. Why? Honestly, for us, preserve the training sites. That's what everything we do 24 7 is to take care of the folks overseas, doing the hard jobs, make sure they have a place to train before they leave and a place to train when, when they come home. That's what we look at now as far as these sustainability planning workshops, partnering workshops. Based on a phone call late last night, we're probably going to have about five or six more states that will be popping up there in the next six months. We've got some end of your funding, again, those resources, those critical resources to help set those up, help dialogue with the community and make sure that the partnering workshops in the future have the folks like you in the room as part of those groups. Tools for compatible land use while we're here, while JLOS is there. Again, one of my other favorite acronyms, ACUB. I'll give a quick blur because it's all about JLUS today, but ACUB is another important tool that the Department of Defense received from Congress. The Pentagon went to Congress and said, we built all our military sites way out in God's country. No one's around us. Well, now 30, 40 years later, people all live right next to us because we're an economic engine. We provide jobs for the community. And all of a sudden, we make noise when we train our soldiers. We shoot guns. We blow things up. That's what we do to make sure our soldiers are the best trained in the world when they go have to do the hard job they have in Afghanistan, and Iraq, and other places. But it doesn't matter what we're doing. We'll get a phone call on a Saturday morning from the guy who just built a new brick house right next to our training site and says, hey, it's 6 in the morning. You're, you're blowing up bombs. You're waking my kids up. Well, again, when I first joined in, in 78, I just say, sir, that's the sound of freedom. Not hang up on them. <laughs> doesn't work anymore. Not even close. Because the next phone call they make is to their elected official. So we have places in the country that don't shoot before 6 in the morning. Don't fly helicopters with night vision goggles after 10 o'clock at night because they bother people. Again, we're, it's the United States. We all need to be happy, but we can't compromise the training of our soldiers. And that's what ACUB is about. That's what JLIS is about, making us the best trained soldiers in the world so we do our job and we come back home to our families and the community. You can see there, there's uh, the sites that already have ACUBs. A couple more, Camp Navajo, Arizona, or any town, uh, Gap, Pennsylvania, will probably be approved next three or four months. And as, again, as of yesterday, we've got four more states that are going to propose ACUBs in their states in uh, uh, Mississippi and um, Arkansas, Texas, I guess in one other state. But again, a good news story. Good segue, good news story like the JLIS. As Michael mentioned, we haven't done a lot of JLIS in the Guard. It's been the bigger active duty sites. Well, we've got thousands of Guard sites, just as important. We appreciate OEA taking the, taking the time and resources to approach the Guard. Joint land use study, a great tool to preserve training for both active component sites and Army National Guard sites. So you see the ones that are underway now? Pretty significant for the Guard when three or four years ago the, it was a big goose head. So again, great progress. And one of the reasons I'm here personally is to help make that number even bigger next year because JLIS is a critical tool for us to, to keep doing that. So again, my segue easily the completed three JLIS has been completed, three joint land use studies for the Guard. Button in North Carolina uh, was the one we're going to talk about today. So I am going to be glad to answer any questions at the end. But I, again, I thank you for being here. I thank you for your, for your support of us in uniform. I'm going to turn it over to the mayor.
Well, good afternoon. Oh, good, you are here. I was just checking to make sure. Nobody's fallen asleep yet. I, I don't know how you could have fallen asleep during that presentation. I thought it was actually riveting. And, and it segued right into mine, so I totally appreciate that. Um, today, we're here to talk about fostering community and military partnerships in support of National Guard training sites. Um, that's not necessarily always an easy thing. So let me start off first by giving you a little bit of a history lesson about Eagle Mountain City, which is the city that I am the mayor of. Eagle Mountain was incorporated in 1996. Seriously, we're 15 years old, we're a toddler as compared to most areas. Now, you might think that that's a little bit unique, but I'm here to tell you that around Camp Williams, there are three cities that have been incorporated since 1996. So Eagle Mountain, and then in 1997, Saratoga Springs, and then in 1999, Harriman City. The camp that we're discussing, and I'll, we'll get there in just a minute, there are only five municipalities that surround it, and three of those five existing since 1996. In that area, there is extremely rapid growth. Um, in 1996, when Eagle Mountain was, uh, was incorporated, there were 250 people that lived there. Today, there are 23,000 people that live there, and Eagle Mountain City incorporates 53 square miles. It's actually larger than Salt Lake City, um, geographically speaking. And then the two are other counterpart cities. Harriman City also has 23,000 people. Um, Saratoga Springs now about 17,000. And the existing cities, Lehigh has also experienced some rapid growth, and they went from a population of about 20,000 to about 44,000 in a very short period of time. When I moved to Eagle Mountain 13 years ago, there were 750 people, and like I say, now 23,000. Our median age is also 14, so we're dealing with a very, very young population. Now, a little bit about Camp Williams. Camp Williams is located 26 miles south of Salt Lake and borders, as I said before, five cities and two counties. Uh, Urban sprawl, that's the term that everybody calls uh, what's going on in Utah specifically. Um, however, I will show you how geographically, frankly, it was necessary for us to move forward in the way that we have. So you can see Camp Williams right here in the center. There's a mountain range here. This is called the Ochre Mountains. There's a mountain range here. This is the Wasatch Front Mountains. And this mountain range is part of the Rockies, runs all the way down through the state. It leaves a very small corridor for growth. Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake is about up here. And so you can see there's just this very narrow stretch of land where you can develop. Here in the Utah County, we have a lake and then yet another mountain that also causes constraint in the areas where you can actually grow. And so we're fully developed through here. There was really no other place for people to start going. So we had to start coming out to these other valleys and expanding. So Harriman here, Bluffdale, Lehigh, Saratoga Springs, and Eagle Mountain all, all surround Camp Williams. And as you said, these camps, they, this was built out in the middle of nowhere. It's called Tickville. It's called Tickville for a reason. It's full of ticks. Um, people don't want to live there. Over here, this is the mountain. We live down below it. Um, but anyway, so people didn't populate that area for a very long time. So 50 years or more, no encroachment, no growth, nothing going on. Um, the cities of Lehigh and Bluffdale basically forgot about Camp Williams and didn't really think about the fact that it even existed. Now, when we came into uh, being in Eagle Mountain, we had to learn to actually embrace our military heritage because, as, uh, as I said, National Guard bases they're not your traditional form bases where you have housing and people that live there, but you have people that, that work on those bases and are involved in your communities. So Eagle Mountain, my husband is actually a, a National Guard soldier and works at Camp Williams, and so he has told me the many times that Eagle Mountain gets referred to as base housing. So know that we embrace our military in Eagle Mountain and in Harriman and in Saratoga Springs, and we had to teach Lehigh and Bluffdale about it. It was really difficult. So we embarked on the process of our, our JLIS study. October of 2009 was the first time that we sat down and met with the OEA, and we're grateful for that opportunity. 
but um, we only had a few of us at the table to start with. Um, and the planners, boy, they come fast, just so you know. Planners love to plan. How many of you are planners? Okay, you love to plan, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna do anything you can to get that opportunity to plan out for the future and put some, something down on paper that people can use in the future. And I think that's wonderful. And because of that, we got a great technical committee going because all the planners wanted to show up and be involved and, and have a, a part and a say in what was going on. But boy, was it hard to get the political leaders to show up to these, to these meetings. The first one we went to, I think we had two mayors there, Harriman and, and Eagle Mountain were the only ones that showed up. And it just took us a long time to get some buy-in. So we finally had a wake-up call. And this was last September. We had a fire at Camp Williams. This was caused, caused by a machine gun fire, actually. So it was actually originated on Camp Williams. And it went off of Camp Williams and into Harriman. And the news, the news stories were, you can't do training at Camp Williams anymore. There's too many homes there. You're going to have to shut down the camp. And it was a huge concern in, in all of the areas. Um, the result, you can see. And you see how close homes are to where the, where the fire was. There were some homes that were taken with the fire. There were not any lives lost. So we, um, we call it a near disaster. Harriman calls it a disaster. The rest of us call it a near disaster because there were no fatalities or anything like that. But it sure did wake everybody up all of a sudden. Everybody just suddenly went, oh my goodness, we better figure out what's going on. And thank goodness we had a tool that we had started using with the JLIS. Now, uh, we also had this other funny thing going on in Washington, and that was the budget. Oh, we have to pass a budget? Oh, wait, let's not pass a budget. Let's wait a little longer. So it took us a while to get through that process with OEA and actually get our, um, our grant approved. We, um, we had been moving down the road, but then we got bogged down a little bit there. But it was very clear that it needed to get moved forward with the resulting that fire. So after the fire, the range did shut down for quite some time, and it didn't start up again until November. This is a photograph of four of the five mayors, along with our um, tag, um, General Tarbit here, and then his assistant, General Burton, who was here, and then four of the mayors from the surrounding communities. Um, again, we, we were able to finally get some buy-in coming from the, the communities, and it's very important. If you don't have that political buy-in, you're not going to ever get anything implemented. So you can plan and plan and plan all day, and then it just sits on the shelf and nothing happens. So it's really critical that you make sure you get this buy-in properly. Now, we're not totally there. We still have a few people we have to get on board. That's my job. My job is that I need to take the time to go out and visit with all of these um, political bodies and help the people that are working diligently in our technical committee um, to bring that message through of how important it is to plan with the Guard and to work together with them and to have a partnership now, the other part to this is you've got to figure out how to navigate through the web of bureaucracy and politics at camp. It's kind of different. And um, anyway, so that took us a little bit. Uh, we, we had a gentleman that was working with us for quite some time on the project. And his feeling was that, frankly, Eagle Mountain and Her Harriman and and Saratoga Springs shouldn't have even existed. He grew up in Lehigh and felt like Camp Williams was put out there for a reason and nothing should ever come close to it. And so he was the wrong guy to have on the bus with us because he wasn't going to get us where we needed to go. Also, he wasn't a gentleman that could make decisions from the um, camp's perspective as well. So it just took us quite a while to finally get to the right person who, one, had the rank to be able to get the right people helping, and two, the ability to make a decision. So finally, we've gotten somebody on board there from that perspective. Um, and in fact, because we are dealing with a camp and it's a state agency with the National Guard as well as with the facility being a facility, we, we have representation from both entities. 
And it just took, like I say, a while to get the right people on board and then for them to have the right people on the policy committee and the right people on the technical committee because there's the guy that makes the decisions and then there's the guy that actually does the, the work. And to get that communicated from the top down of the critical nature of the work to be done. So I don't know how many of you have been, uh, have dealt with somebody on the base and they're, they're helpful there, they wanna help you in there. But what am I supposed to do? I don't know if I can do that. I'm gonna have to run that up the flagpole. So you've gotta learn how to start at the top of the flagpole so it runs down the right way too. But don't forget, you've gotta be friends with the guys at the bottom too because if, if you're not good and don't have a good rapport and relationship with those guys, you won't get anywhere either. But it is, it's kind of a confusing web that you have to work through. Now, I'm not saying that the city version isn't the same because it can be equally as challenging. So you just want to make sure that you take time and don't ever, ever settle for less than that person who really is empowered to make things happen and who wants to be sitting at the table. If you have somebody that doesn't want to be there, get rid of them and find a replacement. It, it really is the most important part of the deal. So we finally had our first um, joint policy session. This is with uh, our policy committee and our technical committee. Our consultants are on site and helping us to start the process. They had come into town. You know, we finally got our uh, grant approved and we're going. And so we've got everybody on, on board and we're spending time getting all the information that we need. And so we're, we're kind of in that information gathering process at this point in time. We're excited to be moving forward and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get through this in the next uh, 12 to 18 months so that we can wrap up the JList process and we wanna move on to that ACUB process as well. So um, we're, we're looking forward to that opportunity. But it's, um, it's always good to get some cohesion and get everybody working together. Um, one of the other important aspects of a JLIS study is also choosing the correct consultant. And more than anything, it's important that you have consensus in choosing your consultant. So make sure that you get somebody that also is experienced. Um, as cities, we don't know anything about, I mean, half the time we don't even speak the same language. You guys speak A Cub and um, let's think, what are some of the TAG, NCOIC, I mean, there's just all these little acronyms of things that go on and you're like, what the heck is that? And then in the cities, we talk about COG and, um, you know, I mean, all these planning documents that we do and just other acronyms and jargon. And so it's really important that you find somebody that can help to translate because if you can't translate, you can't ever accomplish anything. So your consultant is very important in that. They can also, they can navigate you through that process. They can translate between the entities. OEA also helps with that. And thank goodness we have a consultant that speaks military as well as um, government because, oh, I forgot, federal government is also a totally different can of worms as well. And so we, we need to be able to navigate through that. So it's important that we have the right consultant and that we have consensus from everybody that's involved in your joint land use study in making that decision. We were very glad to be able to have a, a unanimous choice of our consultant and um, we feel like that really helps us to be more effective in that process. Um, and again, it's important that we follow through and get the rest of those people who aren't on board yet there with us. So we'll take time and I as chair will make sure that I am taking time to visit um, go and have additional meetings with them and try and help them to understand the importance. Um, those fire pictures really kind of bring everything to, to light for those that haven't thought about it before. Um, Camp Williams has done a great service for us. It's uniquely located right in the middle, obviously. Um, it creates a good neutral ground for us to have meetings. Um, it's important because when you are dealing with cities and especially young ones like we are, we're like toddlers and we fight like kids. We have a little sibling rivalry that's going on and so we have to be really careful and it's a real challenge in balancing how to handle all of those 
um, different personalities and behaviors and characteristics and the things that are important for each of those communities. So we ch have chosen to meet at Camp Williams and we're grateful for that opportunity because it does create a little bit more of a neutral site where nobody feels like they're um, being taken over or, um, or that one entity's ideas are more important than the others. Um, it's also important that you bring in the key stakeholders, landowners, um, other areas of uh, necessity might be uh, transportation people, your different planning organizations for the regions. I know we heard from uh, one of the regional planning organizations from Colorado earlier this week. And um, so make sure that you've got all of those types of people on board. You, you may need to involve your realtor associations, your home builders associations. Don't forget the school districts because there are so many different intricacies and involvements that need to be taken care of. So make sure that you get that going and that that, um, that network is established because that really will help your success in the future. Let's see. And then we're to my question point. So I will now defer to our next presenter. Thank you everyone for hanging out with us on a Thursday afternoon. I know there's been a lot of PowerPoint over the last couple of days, but hopefully what I'm going to give you will, will add some value through time here. I am uh, Captain Drew LeQuick. I'm the operations supervisor for Camp Butner, North Carolina. Uh, I've been in the military for about 13, 14 years now, since I was 18. So if I throw out any military jargon, somebody wave your hand if you don't know what I'm talking about, because I'll do it without even thinking about it. Um, what we're going to do is kind of go through a little bit about Camp Butner so you know the background we're coming from. Then uh, Mr. Barry Baker, the planning director for Granville County, will step up and talk about why JLUS and the process that we went through. And then we'll close it up by talking about the implementation steps that we've gone through so far and what we still have left to do. Camp Butner, we are located in North Carolina. It's been a lot of North Carolina talk here throughout the conference. Most of it centered down around this area and some of it over here in Fayetteville with uh, Fort Bragg. Take about two hours north from Fort Bragg, go just north of the Raleigh-Durham area, you got Camp Butner here, just south of Oxford. We're nestled in between Fort Bragg and Fort Pickett, two much larger military installations. Um, I'll do this slide first. During World War II, uh, you know, government decided they needed to train some more troops to go over support the war. There were a number of bases that came out of the land grabs that happened then. Uh, Camp Butner is one of those. We housed a large training area for field artillery, for small arms, trained most of the 78th Lightning Division in World War II, and we housed a military hospital. Uh, total acreage is about 40,000 acres. The end of World War II still had the property. Federal government no longer needed it. They took a small part. Federal government retained it. State government retained a portion. And 5,000 acres, roughly, went to the North Carolina National Guard, and that's what we now uh, have jurisdiction over. So. The green boundary on here is what used to be Camp Butner in World War II. That was the 40,000 acres. What is here in brown is the current Camp Butner. It's a tiny little piece of what was there originally. But the current Camp Butner splits Durham and Granville counties. Uh, it's about 50% of the land mass on each side. Most of the cantonment area and the key pieces of Butner are on the Granville side. So some of the key players for our JLUs were the Granville County folks, the Durham County folks, and then you have the town of Butner. The town of Butner, you see, is in that old World War II perimeter. This was what was the cantonment area for Camp Butner in World War II. So most of the housing, the barracks, the uh, support buildings, maintenance facilities, warehouses, they were all here in what is present day town of Butner. Um, also a key player is STEM. This is a much smaller community, but they were also important in our JLUS process. And our current mission. Camp Butner Training Center, we basically provide small arms facilities, training facilities, and we do it not just for the North Carolina National Guard, but for a number of different entities. We train Marines, train Navy, train active duty Army coming out of Fort Bragg. You saw how close we were to Fort Bragg, it's about a two hour drive. So when their ranges are full, it's not uncommon at all for those troops to come up our way and utilize our facilities. Um, other DOD agencies, civil authorities, we do a lot of law enforcement. 
most of the local county law enforcement, occasionally state highway patrol, uh, are all users of Camp Butner. The key things we concentrate on are the small arms qualification for the North Carolina Guard, um, the pre-mobilization training, any of the pre-mob training that we can accomplish given our footprint. There are things we can't accomplish with that smaller 5,000 acre footprint, but uh, we do what we can, and advanced marksmanship training. Facilities available. We've got nine small arms ranges. Basically, because of our footprint, we're restricted to 7.62 millimeter and smaller. Any of the larger weapons are not things we fire on, Butner. Um, we also have a number of facilities, land nav, rappel tower, obstacle course. We do some of the virtual training. If anybody was in the training seminar held earlier today, they were talking about the, the use of more and more uh, simulations and simulators. That's what the EST 2000 and the Heat, the Humvee rollover, both fall into that category. We can bill it about 300 people on Camp Butner. Uh, that's one of the ceilings that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Classroom medical support, uh, we've got some growth planned. 400-person uh, containment area will be coming online in the next five to six years. And this slide shows the level of use and throughput. Just to kind of give you an idea of the number of bodies that come through Camp Butner and what's happened leading up to, to JLUS. Um, if you go back to 2000, 2004, we were pretty consistently training about 15,000 throughput days. Throughput days basically a set of boots on the ground for a day. If they use five of our facilities, they use one of our facilities, it's one person being at Camp Butner for a day. So as the mobilization need for the National Guard went up, we started doing more training. We realized the value that Camp Butner could have to the North Carolina National Guard. We increased what was available there. And as we did so, you saw this growth curve jump up. And we had more and more people coming in to Camp Butner. And that affected, of course, the local environment with the amount of noise and traffic that we were producing, the, uh, the times the range complex was operating. And in FY09, we kind of capped out around 55,000. And we've held roughly at that level since then. Uh, our billeting, of limited to about 300 bed spaces, kind of keeps us from growing much more than that. Larger units that would use us don't have the ability to have their soldiers stay on our facility and continue to train the next day. So we don't get any units larger than roughly company sized, company plus. And with that, I'm going to hand over on why we chose to do a joint, loose, joint land use study to uh, Mr. Barry Baker. Thank you, Drew. Uh, good afternoon. I am mayor, one of those planners. Uh, we do mean well when, do, <laughs> when we want to write those plans. <laughs> Um, like Captain LeQuick talked about, uh, Camp Butner is located in both Granville and Dur uh, Durham County, uh, a short commuter distance from the fast-growing Raleigh-Durham area. Growth uh, in our county uh, led to private land development encroachment on the training site. According to the U.S. Census, the census tract surrounding Camp Butner in Granville County grew nearly 2% annually between 2000 and 2010. Five miles away across the interstate, uh, the census tract grew 6%, and that's because we are a bedroom community to Raleigh-Durham. Like you've heard in many other instances, uh, you have residents who will complain um, like Colonel Knott said, um, Camp Butner, I'm sure, would get a lot of calls. You know, they also have helicopters that, uh, that train there uh, from Fort Bragg. And um, so sometimes there's concerns about helicopter noise, uh, where they're flying, uh, and then also uh, their shooting ranges, from their shooting ranges. Really what started our process was a now retired uh, colonel uh, from the North Carolina National Guard, uh, John Shaw. Um, we had a subdivision that was approved in the planning office in Granville County uh, on what was undeveloped land. And 
houses started being built. And it surprised, I believe, Colonel Shaw at the time and the National Guard. And not long after that, he came to my office. And first communication with uh, Colonel Shaw was really, how did this happen? Well, you know, Colonel Shaw, it's private land. Um, property owner wanted to divide it and sell homes and, buy, uh, and sell, sell the land for homes. We had a continued communication and that's one of the things that I think that everybody needs. From the military side, if you see a problem outside your fence, go talk to the local people. I mean, I, I don't know a, a clearer point to make. Don't, don't anticipate that the community will come to you because they see a problem. If you see a problem impacting your mission, go to your local government and talk about it. Colonel Shaw, um, after we talked, I recommended that he go and talk to our elected bodies. Elected body in Granville County, um, he took up that great job of going and talking to the elected bodies, not only in our county, but in Durham County uh, and in the towns that were in the area that Captain LeQuick talked about, Buckner and Stem. And he got early buy-in from the elected people. He did that of his own volition. At a few months later, I talked again with him, and, um, and he talked about OEA. And all local government love to hear about programs where funding comes from an outside source. If I remember correctly, I believe OEA paid for 80% of the cost of the plan of the study. 20% cost was, um, was shared by the local communities. And it, from our standpoint, it was in kind, in kind. It did not have to be a direct cash uh, payment out of a budget, other than the use of our time. Uh, we also uh, helped with mail outs, and, we, and we'll get into that a little later. But what really Colonel Shaw emphasize was the economic impact. We've all heard that this week. It can't be minimized. The economic impact for your community, especially in this day and age, when we first talked in two, uh, or late 2006, uh, it was still booming. We all have uh, seen what's happened in the economy in the last four years. Um, economic impact of what your base does is going to get the attention of the elected people. And they, they understand, and that's what they want. They want jobs. Um, and why, again, the, the joint land use study? The joint land use study allowed the community and the National Guard to work together to ensure the future compatibility between the site's military mission and increasing the civilian and the increasing civilian development occurring near the installation. After the OEA came to the town of Butner and met with uh, representatives that not only of the local governments but of the state, a policy committee was formed. We got the grant. Uh, we were assisted because it was a regional effort, not just one county and its municipalities, but it will help with when not all counties and their municipalities always agree. Uh, our Council of Government, in North Carolina you have a Council of Government that, that helps and assists with regional planning. And they were uh, the, the recipient of the funding for our JLUs. We all got together 
an elected, primarily an elected body formed the policy committee. Uh, to a, a Granville County Commissioner, a Durham County Commissioner, the town of Butner Mayor at the time, and also the mayor of STEM. We also had representative, Colonel Shaw was on that policy committee from the National Guard, and uh, the state of North Carolina has a, 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 owns a lot of property because of the history of Camp Butner and how the land was divided off after the Army uh, left after World War II, uh, NC State uh, Beef Cattle Research, the ag uh, component of our policy committee. And there's one of the first meetings of our uh, policy committee. First thing they did was the policy committee, before really establishing technical committees, subcommittees, they established goals because there is local politics. Uh, and there was two county governments that don't always see uh, eye to eye on uh, certain uh, issues. They, the policy committee drafted this from the beginning to organize themselves and to try to um, get going because what we've all heard and some other is that sometimes there's a lag time. The folks got together, they established the five goals. And again, the first goal was to ensure compatibility of land uses between Camp Butner and the surrounding communities in both the short and long term. Education outreach to surrounding communities regarding Camp Butner activities and the mission. There had not always been communication between the training site and the community, and folks wanted to see that. In our area, um, we are just north of uh, the city of Raleigh's drinking water source, a, a lake, Falls Lake. Uh, and it's a very uh, protected, however, um, there are in environmental concerns with the lake and the water quality. So uh, a third goal was to ensure environmental protection. That's again, melding uh, local issues, state issues, and, and, and the National Guard issues uh, because when this process begins, you will find that uh, you know, there are local issues that the military hasn't thought about outside uh, the fence, but that when you bring people together, people can talk about that issue. The fourth goal was to ensure public involvement, and that's very important. Uh, in any planning process, and I am a planner, you've got to involve the public. If you don't, you may get to the end of the process and have a room full of people who have questions and may not understand what, what's going on and what are you doing and may derail it. And goal five was protect the health, safety, and welfare of the employees of Camp Butner and the residents in the surrounding community. They also established stakeholder objectives. I'm not really going to talk about all those objectives. Uh, it is in the presentation. Um, they were basically developed from uh, the goals that were established. Then the policy committee got to the work of what information do we need? And we've heard in other sessions earlier this week about the need for uh, GIS information. Uh, basically, part of uh, our process was that the local governments, as part of their in-kind, would provide GIS information. So there was a GIS working group. There was a land use working group. Talk about zoning. Now, I know that that may be a bad word to folks in, general, in other parts of the country. Uh, land use. Call it land use. Land use includes subdivision regulations and other 
regulations. It may not entail zoning. And we had an environmental issues working subgroup. The policy committee also established a study area. And the study area was the one mile perimeter of, the, of Camp Butner. And that was important because we did want to involve the public. Who, do, who would impact Camp Butner in regard to private land development? And also, we wanted to, wanted to send and, and involve the public. So it was established that folks within that one mile would receive notice of, of our stakeholder meetings. Um, Planners sometimes call them charrettes, uh, strategic planning. You basically want to have input. We also uh, sent uh, folks within that one mile buffer um, a survey. We also, uh, a very inexpensive way to uh, carry on a survey, if you've never done it, is Survey Monkey. We also did that and we advertised it. But we sent our survey to everyone within that one mile radius. And these were some of the, the results from the public survey. 61% responded with a favorable opinion of Camp Butner, which surprised folks. Some folks thought that there might have been more of a negative, but there was 61% responded with favorably of Camp Butner, 67% responded that they do hear noise at their home or business during the day, and this 36% responded they sometimes find the noise objection objectionable, and 12% always find the noise objectionable. Um, the majority of the respondents lived in the study area for more than 10 years and owned tracks large than five acres, and that's important in that before the survey occurred, many folks believed that, that we were having a lot of new uh, residents move in, and what we found out is the majority were, had lived there for a long time. Uh, and I think that that also coalesces with uh, the, re the favor response. Someone who's been there longer will know what's there, and um, will accept it. We sent uh, information and we advertised in our papers and we sent uh, letters to all the folks within one, one mile of the, the, the camp and invited them to a meeting. We had our mayor, uh, the chairman of our policy committee was the mayor of Butner, Mr. Edgar Smoke. Um, he attended and started the presentation. And, and again, and Colonel Shaw and members of the National Guard were there, and they also took part in the presentation. It showed folks that there was leadership, both in, from the National Guard standpoint and from the community. 55 folks attended the workshop. And to the a good little project to do when you have a charade is to have a map and let people put where they where they live and uh, it makes them appreciate the fact that that they're important and when they did that most of the attendees were uh, from the area just north of the border of the camp which made sense in that probably the closest firing range is uh, to the border of Camp Butner is to, to the north in the northern area. And at that meeting, it was the first meeting really, and of the public and where they were involved, uh, they indicated concern with the noise from the gunfire and the helicopters. And our, the mayor and, um, and the National Guard did a very good uh, job in answering questions. Many of their questions were questions that folks had for a long time. 
and there was acceptance uh, after that first meeting. They were still concerned about helicopters. Nine months later, we had our second. And between, in the interim nine months, uh, we took what uh, survey information and responses we got to better help draft our plan. And we worked with those subcommittees and the policy committee, and we had a draft plan by the time the second workshop occurred. And at that meeting, we, ha we was held to familiarize residents. We did the same process. We advertised, we sent letters inviting folks to come. We set up just like we did the first meeting. Everybody was there to talk with, uh, from both the, the local community, the elected folks, and National Guard. Forty uh, citizens attended the workshop. We may have gotten one negative comment. They accepted our draft report. And, you know, when you get to that point after working on it, I would say we had, it took a year and a half. Uh, you know, it, it, it's very, it makes you feel good to know that uh, the, the residents that really are, could be impacted um, accept uh, both the military mission and uh, in the document. And there you can see the community talking with the National Guard. There were 23 policy recommendations that were adopted by the policy committee. Uh, two months after the draft report uh, was introduced to the public, within two months, uh, Granville County, Durham County, Town of Stem, Town of Butner adopted the JLUS report. So we, you're, when you adopt a plan, you don't want it to go on a shelf. Um, these are the 23 implementation uh, uh, goals. Something to take from this session, I believe, is that you don't stop at the adoption of the plan. You've got, to, you've got to continue the work on the implementation. And so um, one of the recommendations from the plan was uh, the establishment of an implementation team consisting of local government staff and the National Guard. And we have been meeting, the, the plan was approved or adopted in August of 2009. Every, every six months we meet uh, to uh, Durham County, Granville County, Butner, STEM, and the National Guard meet to, to go over what we've done to facilitate implementation. In my county, um, we've adopted land use ordinance amendments. Um, the primary concern that, that came up was, again, residential encroachment on um, on the camp. Uh, what we've adopted in our land use regulations are a 50 foot undisturbed buffer for private land subdivision when they subdivide adjacent to the training site. We, no we notify all applicants for zoning permits within one half mile of the training site of the existence of the National Guard training site. Um, it's not uncommon for someone to say, I didn't know that that, that landfill was over there or that, that land use was over there when they buy new into a, uh, an area. Had same comments from new residents that I didn't know that Camp Butner was there, and I'm surprised that anyone's shooting there. Well, what we do is we place a notice on the zoning permit. It's the first permit someone gets when they want to build a home so that they know. Uh, we notify Captain LeQuick of any proposed major subdivision within one mile of the training site. Uh, that's something new. Um, we do that so that they can so that the 
National Guard can be part of our planning process and approval process and provide any information and concerns they may have. Uh, what we found during the process is that uh, there was actually a new state law that required um, military bases to be notified of rezonings within, within five miles of the training site. So we, we adopted that per state law and as a recommendation. We also um, notify Captain LeQuick of any ordinance amendments we make that affect permitted uses. And also we involve Captain LeQuick and the National Guard in any proposed special or conditional use within one mile of our training site. And there's a, can y'all hear me? Okay, I'll just keep my seat for a second. There's a few implementation pieces on this slide that Camp Butner implemented as a result of recommendations of the study. Uh, two of the big concerns within the community were the, the noise from the live firing and communication. Um, from, in order to minimize our live fire noise, we adapted, adopted the time limitations of 0 8 to 2200. And that fits for 99% of the training. We still have exceptions that have to go outside of that especially during summertime hours when we've got larger units that need to rotate through for night fires, but they're very seldom now. And we do our best to coordinate multiple units that need to fire during limited visibility to fire on the same night. That way it minimizes the number of disturbances to the local, local population. Um, in order to increase communication with the local communities, uh, we publish a periodic news article. The recommendation was once a quarter I haven't been as good as I should have about doing once a quarter, but about twice a year I've been able to get out an article that gives an update on, hey, these are the key events that have happened at Camp Butner. Here are some key events that are coming up. And I always try to talk about some of our community events. We now host four events a year. Um, you can see a few of them listed out there. Getting ready to host a 10K mud run that supports a local charity. Uh, we support another local charity, the Roarton Club, by doing a trail ride. They bring horses and trailers. We shut down the, the camp for uh, one weekend. Horses and trailers, and they ride all over, and people get to see the camp and the facilities that we have there. Uh, we host civilian marksmanship program matches. Uh, so we bring people from the local community on to shoot matches, and they can actually utilize our ranges to do that. And uh, we're getting ready to host in April of this coming year. We're going to do a concert. It's going to be held in the... Uh, on one of our ranges, it's a known distance range, there's plenty of land space for festival seating. And uh, we're gonna have Jason Michael Carroll with us being in Nashville, we got a country star coming. And he's actually from Granville County, so he's really interested in coming out for that. We also, we're in much better communication now. Uh, we talk very often with the town of Butner, with Granville County, with Durham County as a result of this study. And some pending improvements, two things that, uh, we're looking at doing is developing a public web page. We really don't have one out and about yet. We've got uh, the designs for one, and that's something that'll happen within the next quarter. And upgrading our noise monitor systems. We actually have a series of noise monitor systems that capture the noise levels for the various usage around base. And those systems uh, are being upgraded to a newer model that'll give us a, a better ability to track what caused that noise. So we'll be able to distinguish between helicopter noise and firing noise and vehicle traffic rather than just being able to record a decibel level. And these are just some lessons learned um, in our process. Um, strong leadership is important from both the community and the military. Public involvement is the key. Many concerns were voiced early at early meetings the broad consist consensus was uh, found at later meetings. Always emphasize the importance of the base to the community. Express clearly how the military mission can be compromised by private land development or any other impact to the base. And emphasize action through encouraging implementation, implementation teams after the study is finished. And I just want to thank OEA for the invitation, and uh, this is a great, great, been a great conference. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat>
before I open it up to questions and answer um, segment, uh, just just a couple of things I just want to um, put out there because again, I'm pretty sure in the audience we may have some community representatives who may be at the very beginning stages of um, um, uh, pursuing a JLIS project, or you, we may actually have some community members as well as military um, representatives in the room who may be thinking about the possibility of their um, training um, site being nominated for a JLIS. Um, when when we as the Office of Economic Adjustment provide um, support um, to allow communities to carry out a joint land use study. We, we actually um, provide a mix of 90% um, federal funding support um, with the responsibility of a 10% um, um, match, typically in the form of either um, cash or um, staff time towards the um, total budget uh, piece. But then second, and I don't know if any of you um, caught on to it, but um, with regards to the type of support a uh, community typically um, attempts to use to carry out a joint land use study may vary. So for example, if a um, community that is, is very, I guess, how can I put this, resource rich with regards to the technical staff capability to carry out a, a JLIS, then they may decide to just um, carry out the JLIS internally. Whereas if you're dealing with a community that may be smaller uh, and less capacity, they may um, decide to go the route of utilizing a consultant to help them facilitate the JLIS process. Um, so that being said, let me go ahead and open it up to questions at this time. And again, if you have a question, if you can possibly step up to the microphone so that everybody can hear your question. Wow, these guys did great on the panel, apparently. <laughs> However, just like that one student in the classroom, just when the bell's getting ready to ring. Oh, okay, I was getting ready to ask a question. Come on up. Or unless you can speak loud back there. Okay. We're early enough in the process that actually we're really just starting with that. So part of it is just making sure that we have all the right stakeholders in, involved. And so we're currently each municipality and uh, each county is putting together a list of specifically who owns the private lands that are right around Camp Williams so that we can start that involvement process. We intend to have several public meetings so that they don't feel left out of that process, that they are included. And, uh, and I'm sure that we will get to a point where it will get a little trickier, uh, but we, we will reach out to them even individually if necessary, as well as in public meeting forums. Okay. One question I was gonna ask of um, Mayor Jackson, and this is uh, something I've seen done a couple of times at other JLIS um, sites where they're just beginning to ramp up to do the study, is, is the military offering community representatives the opportunity to actually conduct a tour of the base so they can become familiar with what really is going on at the base. Now, I know you guys went through that at the early stages. Did you want to sh share that a little bit with the group? Well, as we were talking about this early on, um, I know that each of the cities has, or several of the cities have made requests to get tours on the base and, and range control has made that happen. And then during our policy meeting, I, I also made a request to the guard that we get to have, frankly, a flyover tour so we could really get a grasp of what we're looking at from, uh, you know, that, that bird's eye view, which is a totally different perspective. And so they have set that up for us and we're hoping to do that at the end of September and looking forward to that opportunity. Um, we're hoping that it might also help with a little bit more of our political buy-in as well. You know, something about a helicopter ride is kind of cool, right? <laughs> okay, one thing I did ask each of the panelists to, um, to do, and I mentioned at the very beginning of this um, session, was to pretty much um, give us just one piece of information, um, uh, a critical piece that has um, helped with regards to this whole notion of compatible land use around National Guard facilities. So um, that being said, I'll start with uh, Colonel Knott again. Thanks, Michael. My voice is still going pretty good. I've got uh, one takeaway message and one re request to the folks here. The takeaway message is that a compatible land use starts with partnership. You cannot have a successful partnership as it's based on trust education and what the issues are. Trust as far as it's a personal relationship. It sounds corny, but you build a personal relationship between, in this case, the guard 
the community members, elected officials, interested citizens of the United States in that area is based on trust. It's also based on education because we talk different languages. You heard the acronyms going on. Based on education of the issues. And again, one of the things I did not mention is education partnerships is what we do in the Guard for sustainability. We're actually ready to roll out in the next six week, weeks a partnership with a university, um, Arizona State University, top university in the country for sustainability on education courses all online that the soldiers and civilians can enroll and take again to understand what the military is all about and just as importantly how it impacts the community and how important the community is to us and I actually got Dorenda from Arizona here if you're interested she's got some handouts again I'll take my five second sales pitch but again you have to ed educate yourself on the issues in both the military and our, our community members so stop by Dorenda can give you a quick handout hand on that Last one before I pass on to the mayor is a request. Some of you folks have been in the military. Some folks I know all support the military. When you're traveling around your town, you're, you're flying somewhere busy, you see one of our young soldiers, airmen, civilian marines, in the airport coming home from Afghanistan, Iraq. They work 24-7. They do it because they deserve, they deserve, they have a pride in their country. They don't ask for anything. But if you see one walking through an airport and you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, take two seconds and thank them. I've talked to thousands of them in the last 10 years, and there's nothing more important to them than somebody who they protect and serve every day to take two seconds and think of what they do. That'll pass on the mayor. Thank you. Before I get to my tidbit, I just thought I'd mention to you, um, in, in response to your saying thank you, at Eagle Mountain City, we established, um, when I first got elected as mayor, it, we do a welcome home parade. For every single soldier that comes home that we get notified of, if we don't get notified, it's kind of hard to do it. But um, but literally every soldier, and it doesn't matter what time of day or night it is. I've uh, we get our fire trucks and our sheriff's department out, and I I sit in the fire truck and every one I, I missed one unfortunately recently, but um, 3 a.m. we'll do it, and it's it's awesome. And there's nothing better than um, the opportunity we have to to thank those that have served for us. So I, I have appreciated that opportunity. Um, the take home piece for me is that uh, making sure that you have the right people involved in your study. And I mean the right, the right people on your policy committee, those that can make those decisions that are necessary. So the right elected officials, some cities you may have you know, council member involvement or mayor's involvement, but if you don't have the one that's passionate about it, Find another one. If you don't have the the buy-in from your base and have the, somebody that's passionate about it, go back and work harder and establish that relationship. Work on that that trust that you have to work to, to gain so that you get the right person on that on that bus and on that pro, uh, that policy committee. It is so important for that buy-in. But don't forget that you also need to have the right people at your technical level because if you don't have the people there that have the knowledge and expertise to accomplish the task, then it's going to be a worthless project and it won't be worth it completing it. So just make sure that you get the right people on board and take the time to do it because it is important. Coming out after a J. Luce and looking back at the things that have helped the most since we conducted it. Uh, going through the process and getting the recommendations and, and, and starting to build from that was a good stepping stone. But really what it's done is opened up those lines of communication. Now if there's something going on, I can go and talk to Barry Baker. I know who he is. He knows who I am. I know what he needs. He knows what I need. Um, so on the Granville County with the land side, with the uh, land management and planning side, um, town of Butner. I talk to the Butner town manager now very frequently. Um, the Durham County side, I don't talk to as much, but I know who the point of contacts are and we can connect when we need to. So along the same lines as what you've heard the other folks up here say, it, you build those relationships and, and being able to communicate with them after they know your needs and you know theirs is, is really the key. Um, being able to, to pick up the phone and call and talk to the people who can help. And maintain those relationships just Get involved and, and make sure that your plan is being implemented. Establish implementation team and um, just maintain those relationships. Okay. 
Well, again, um, to all of our panelists, we definitely appreciate all of you taking your time to come here and talk about this topic with us uh, today, as well as everyone in the audience for you know sticking through the um, session, as well as the rest of the um, sessions. This week has definitely been jam-packed with some much important information on uh, maintaining compatibility around these um, installations. So um, just to, to wrap up, as we obviously have heard um, from the panelists, you know, even though these um, particular training sites may be on a smaller scale compared to their active duty counterparts, the bottom line is they are still helping to um, support the mission of ensuring that, that our warfighters are in fact well prepared before being put in harm's way and that they are um, able to have the best resources possible to be able to carry out their um, mission. Um, I think it goes without saying at this point that definitely the leadership from both sides of the fence, from the community and the military, has got to be there when it comes to um, doing this compatible um, land use planning effort. But also, um, importantly, is for communities as well as the military to understand everything that's in the toolbox. And we talked about a number of programs, um, such as a statewide um, sustainability program that Colonel Knott um, um, discussed, as well as ACUB and JLIS. And just being able to really uh, identify what those tools are and the, the most appropriate tools to use. Um, so that being said, um, I always learned uh, from my military career that uh, we train the standard, not the time. So that being said, with 10 minutes extras to spare, uh, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists today. <laughs> and thank all of you. So um, again, uh, we're going to have the OEA wrap-up session here at 3.30. Thanks.